Okay, we're in week six of an eight-week series titled Stronger. Say, I need to get stronger. I need to get stronger. Come on, I don't believe you. Say, I need to get stronger. I need to get stronger. Okay, and we're just preaching one by one through our eight core values as a church. My big ask for you in this series is that every single week you would take one next step of faith. And the first week we talked about authentic community, and the big next step was getting a small group. The next week we talked about sacrificial service, and the big next step was join the dream team. The third week we talked about obedience to God's word, and the big next step was to commit your life to saying, whatever God says to me, my answer is yes, Lord Jesus. The fourth week we talked about fervent prayer. We said prioritize First Wednesday. Don't know if you know this, but First Wednesday happens every first Wednesday of the month, all right? So just let you know it's there for you. You can get it in your calendar. The fifth week, last week, we talked about spirit-empowered worship. And the big next step was to consider every area of our life and ask the question, is Jesus on the throne of my heart or is something else sitting on that throne? We said, look at your time, your talents, your treasure, your relationships, and ask the question, is Jesus on the throne or something else on the throne? And whatever is sitting on that throne of your heart, dethrone it and put him back on it. Amen? Amen. Okay, four of us did it. We're going good today at King's Church. All right. Today, today we're looking at bold witness. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a witness. Turn to your other neighbor, your second choice, and say, you too. You too. Just let them know you matter as well. My goal today is very, very simple. I want to stir your heart to a position of faith that God can use you and that God has called you to lead people to faith in his son, Jesus Christ. My prayer is that every single one of you would be used in your life to help someone else come into a relationship with God. One of my greatest griefs as a pastor is knowing that many Christians never experience that joy. And if you will experience that joy of walking someone, holding their hand and walking them across the line of faith into a relationship with Jesus Christ, your entire life will change. You will begin to see your faith and this church through a different set of lens. You'll see your life differently and you will experience a joy that is second only to a relationship with Jesus Christ himself. Because many of us don't see the world the way that Jesus sees the world. Many of us, we go to a Royals game or a Chiefs game or a concert and we see a crowd and we see something different than what God sees. If you're extroverted, you probably see a crowd and you see a party, right? Like the bigger the crowd, the bigger the party. If you're introverted, which sociologists say 70% of people are social introverts, so most of you are social introverts, you don't want to be at a party, you want to be at a little cocktail table with two other people having small talk or playing a board game, that's 70% that's of people. If you're introverted, you see a crowd and you don't see a party, you see anxiety, right? Like you just, uh, you know, and, and you're looking for a wall to lean up against and a phone to stare at to act like, I'm okay, but you're not okay because I see anxiety. When Jesus saw a crowd, he didn't see a party and he didn't see anxiety, he saw something else. If you look at it, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, we're going to be in verse 36 through 38 this morning, then we'll pop around to a few other verses. Actually, I'm just going to read it for us, and then we'll kind of dive into our message. If you'll stand with me to honor the reading of God's word, pray that God speaks to us as we see what Jesus saw as he looked at a crowd in Matthew chapter 9. The way I'm going to do it, I'm just going to read it for you, and then at the end you can say this, I'm going to say this is the word of the Lord and you can say a good amen, okay? So Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the word of the Lord, and all God's people said... Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. So let's just unpack this first passage bit by bit here. He says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. When you look at the emotional life of Jesus Christ, the number one emotion expressed in his life is the emotion of compassion. This word compassion is actually a word that has two words at its root, calm and passion. Passion means to suffer. Calm means with. 
So Jesus saw the crowds and he suffered with them. Ultimately, he would express the passion of Jesus Christ and suffer for their sins on the cross. But when he saw them, he had empathy and he entered into their suffering and his heart was torn for them because he saw that they were harassed and helpless, harassed by the devil, helpless in their sin like sheep without a shepherd. In order to become a bold witness, we must first see people the way that God sees them. You must see people the way that God sees them. One of the greatest prayers we should pray as Christ followers is, God, open my eyes to see what I can't see. Open my eyes to see what you see when you look out on a lost and dying world. One of the things I'll do now and then is I'll prayer walk different neighborhoods, and as I'm walking by the houses, I'll say, God, give me your heart for the people in that house. Open my eyes to see what you see, not just the, the white picket fence, not just the beautiful decor, not, not just the manicured yard, not, not just what I see on the outside, but God, help me to see what you see in that home. The marriage that's broken, the children that are struggling, the drug addiction, the, the, the pornography. Help me to see what you see, that I might have a heart like you have. One of the first things we need to do is see what he sees. And, 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 and if you see what God sees, you'll begin to see that all 8 billion people on our planet are the exact same. All of us are sheep in need of a shepherd. And at first that sounds cute. Until you understand what sheep are. And then it's offensive. <laughs> How many people you've seen that little reel of the sheep that got stuck in the ditch? And the shepherd gets down there and lifts him out. And that sheep in two just swift hops somehow ends up right back in the ditch. And you watch this reel and you laugh. That dumb sheep. His stupid sheep. That blind sheep. Did he not see? He was just stuck in a ditch ready to die. The shepherd saves him. And he, whoosh, whoosh, right back in <laughs> the ditch of his death, right? Like this is this dumb sheep. And I'm watching this, and as I'm laughing, I'm thinking, wait. <laughs> the analogy Jesus gave for me is that I am a sheep who needs a shepherd. We are dumb, ignorant, stupid, sinful people. Welcome to King's Church. <laughs> destined for death. <laughs> destined for eternal death. We are sheep in need of a shepherd, and lest we ever forget that just because we're found sheep doesn't mean we're better than lost sheep, doesn't mean that we matter more than lost sheep. It just means that somebody told us about the shepherd, and when we heard about the shepherd, and we believed in the shepherd, and we received the shepherd, he poured out mercy for our sins, and he saved us from them, and he has called us to be those who are a bold witness to the world around us, to go to lost sheep and tell them that they can have a shepherd, that this good news of Jesus Christ is not just for us, but it's for the world. As, as John chapter 3, 16 says, that God so loved not just the saved people, not just the found sheep, he loved the world that he gave. His only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but inherit eternal life. That whoever believes, Romans 10 goes on to tell us, how will they believe if they never hear? How will they hear if no one goes? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Our calling in Christ is to be a bold witness. But the problem is we'll never care about the things we can't see. That's why we can have flooding in Nepal, thousands of people dying, and we go, that's so sad, and we move on with our life. Because we aren't close enough to see it and therefore care about it. If what happened in Asheville, North Carolina, happened in Raytown, Missouri, you would care more because it's closer to you, you can see it more. In order to care, in order to have compassion, in order to do what Christ did, he was moved by love. We must see what he saw. How many people know what nearsighted means? You've not just heard it, you actually know what it means. It's the only medical condition that, 
that diagnoses you for the thing that you're good at. <laughs> you understand that, right? Nearsighted means you can't see far away, but you can see up close, all right? That's like breaking your arm and the doctor's like, your legs work. I'm going to diagnose you with good legs. <laughs> like, well, my arm's broken, but you got good legs. You know, it's like, you're nearsighted. Congratulations, but you can't see far away. I heard a pastor recently say, he said, the church in the West is so nearsighted. We see our problems, our pain, our life, our relationships, our finances, but we don't see what God sees. We don't see the world around us. Until maybe you go on a missions trip and you get up close and personal with something that looks very different than our daily reality. We must see what he sees to love who he loves. The first step is seeing. The second step is believing that there are people all around you ready to receive Christ. I want you to get this deep in your mind and your heart today. There are people everywhere you go this week that are ready to receive Christ. There are people at the grocery store. There are people at the coffee shop. There are people in your neighborhood. There are people in your workplace. There are people in your family unit that are ready to receive Christ if a Christian would simply share Christ with them. There are people all around you who are ready to receive. Jesus said it like this, Matthew 9, 37. He said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful. Okay, if you think about a business, a business has supply and demand, right? Supply and demand. The harvest is plentiful. There's not a demand issue, Jesus says. There's plenty of people who are ready to receive him. Actually, John chapter 4, he goes on, he says, the fields are white for harvest. What does that mean? It means it is harvest season, baby. The farmer put in the seeds. The rain has poured down on their hearts. The sun has shined on their hearts. And there is a harvest of people ready to receive Christ. There's not a demand issue in the kingdom. There are people all around us ready to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. He goes on, he says, but the laborers, it's a supply issue. The laborers are few. God is in the business of saving souls. And he's called us to be his messengers to a lost and dying world. The problem is not that people aren't ready. The problem is that we haven't preached the gospel to them. He goes on in verse 38, and he gives us the solution to the problem, which isn't go get busy, but first get on your knees and pray. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. We must always remember it's his harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. God is the one who raises up and sends people out. And if you begin to pray this prayer, I'm just warning you, I'm just warning you, you start praying, God, would you send out laborers into your harvest field? You're probably going to have an Isaiah 6 moment where the Lord comes to you and, and kind of knocks on your door like, yeah, I hear your prayer. Will you answer it and be one of those laborers? Will you be a worker working in God's field to help people come to know Christ. Here's something I want you to know, that being a witness is not just what God has called you to do, but it's actually already who you are. Turn to your neighbor, tell him again, you're a witness. Come on, do it with some enthusiasm to the person next to you. Act like you care. You're a witness. 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 I tell you all the time at King's Church, you're a citizen of the kingdom. You are a, a son and daughter of the king, but you, you also need to know you are a witness. This isn't just what you do. This is who you are. Acts chapter 1 verse 80 says, but you'll receive power when the spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. Not you'll do witnessing. You'll be, it's, a, it's an identity. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I want to say to you this way, every Christian, if you've called upon the name of Jesus, if you've not called upon the name of Jesus, I hope you hear today, there's a church full of people who love you, who want you to know Christ. There's a God in heaven who gave his son for you, who wants you to have a relationship with him. But if you are a Christian, you are called by God and empowered by his spirit to be a witness to the world around you. That is already true of you. I find this so helpful because it means it's not, it, I'm not trying to become something I'm not. I'm simply trying to step into who I already am. It's like when my wife was pregnant with our firstborn, Summer Grace. 
And I had all this anxiety about being a first-time father. And then it clicked, oh, I'm not going to be a father in four months. There's a baby in her womb. I'm already a father. I don't, I'm not thinking about something I am going to become. I, I'm, I'm already this. Now I just got to step into it. In the same way, I don't want you to think, man, that'd be awesome if I could be that courageous. That'd be so cool if I could be that charismatic. That'd be so amazing if I had the boldness to bring up Jesus in a conversation. I wish I was a witness. No, no, no. You already are a witness. You've been called. You've been empowered. You've been given everything you need for life and godliness. It's just a matter of doing what he's already told you to do and being who he's already made you to be. It takes all the pressure off, especially when you come to the place of realizing the results aren't up to you. So, so my job isn't to save people. My job is just to take the message of Jesus to them, and then he does his thing in their, in their life. Amen. And so I'm going to give you four things that you can do to step into your identity to being a witness. Number one, you need to believe in Jesus. You need to get saved before you can preach the message of salvation, all right? And you can do that today, okay? Amen? Amen. amen. If you've gotten saved in this room before, just say amen. Amen. Come on now. Okay, you can believe in Jesus. Number two, you got to receive the Spirit's empowerment. I have a friend, his name's Graham Allen. He, he planted a church in Austin, Texas, one of the most uh, courageous witnesses for Jesus I've ever met. And I was, I was everywhere I went, Graham is sharing his faith with people. I'm at breakfast at this taco joint, eating, eating a breakfast burrito with like jalapenos on it. It's 8 a.m. in the morning. Like, what am I doing? This is going to be terrible, you know. And I'm eating this burrito, and I look up, and his wife, Kimberly,'s gone. I'm like, where'd Kimberly go? Oh, I think she went to the bathroom. Okay, 10 minutes later, where's Kimberly? We stand up to go find Kimberly. She's standing over a table of 12 firefighters sharing Christ with him. And I was like, who are these people? And I asked Graham, I said, Graham, how do you do it? Everywhere you go, you tell people about Christ. And he said, Dylan, it's simple. Every morning I get up and I get in God's word and I pray and I say, God, fill me with your spirit. And he said, Dylan, here's my goal. I want to be so full of the spirit that it's like I jumped in a pool of God's river. And I get out and everywhere I step, there's a puddle everywhere I go because I'm soaking wet with the presence of God. And I said, amen. And I said, great, pray for me that I would have what you have. And God has done just a little bit of it in my life. I've had a little taste of what he's had. And it has been one of the greatest joys of my life. You need to receive the Spirit's empowering. Number three, you need to go to those far from God. Can I tell you this, Matthew 5? Jesus said, church, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Do you know where salt does no good? In the salt shaker. If you just leave the salt in the salt shaker, it does nobody any good. My grandfather had a farm when I was growing up, and there was little salt licks out on the farm for the deer to come and lick the salt, and it was kind of like you could set them up and then kill them. You know, I was just, sorry for all you who love Bambi, but I was a deer hunter, all right? And uh, these salt licks did no good if he kept them in the barn. They only did good if you scattered them across the farm. The salt shaker does no good on your steak if you leave it in the salt shaker. You only, the salt is only good if it goes out into a lost and dying world. The light does no good in a fully lit room. The light only does good in the darkness. And the darker it is, the brighter the light shines. Friends, you got to go. Some of y'all have been in a Christian cul-de-sac. All right, you've been saved for too long. Everybody you know already knows Jesus. You need to make some friends. You need to pursue some relationships with people who don't know Christ because God has called you to be a light in a dark world. Number four, you need to open your mouth and tell them the good news. I read a book years ago called The Faithful Witness by a man, by a man named Jerry Wiles. Jerry Wiles was a businessman. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a preacher. He was a businessman. And he traveled the world for his business, and literally everywhere he went, he told people about Christ. In a restaurant, at the hotel, in front of the hotel, at the train station, everywhere he went, he told people about Christ. And I mean, I remember reading stories about Jerry Wiles where he'd be on the train and he would share Jesus with someone, and they would come to faith in Christ. And then after he prayed with them to receive Christ, he would turn to the person next to him or behind him and say, hey, I noticed you were listening while I was sharing with them 
would you like to receive Jesus also? And then he'd pray with that person to receive Christ. He, sometimes there were 11 people in a string of salvations who received Christ because of sharing it with one person. He didn't do it on a stage. He didn't do it through, through video. He just one-on-one -on -one shared Christ with people. And in his book, he says there's two keys to being a faithful witness or a bold witness for Jesus Christ. You know what they were? He said, number one, you need to just have conversations with people who don't know God. You're never going to share Christ with someone who doesn't know him if you don't talk to someone who doesn't know him. He says the second thing, if you're willing to bring up the name of Jesus, if you just do those two things, have a conversation and bring up his name. You could be talking about the economy and just say, hey, by the way, what do you think about Jesus? You could be as awkward as awkward gets. And if you're just willing to have a conversation and bring up his name, you'll probably be used by God to lead a whole lot of people to Christ throughout your lifetime. The reality is this is not a task given to some special Christians. This is something given to everyone who calls on his name. You got to get that deep in your soul. God has called you to be a courageous and bold witness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 probably says it better than anywhere else. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's a reason for a good amen, somebody. Let me say it to you one more time because maybe you're like me and you had a really jacked up, messy, sinful past. And you know how bad you was. And you know how sinful you were. And you, you know how far gone you were. Maybe you got a family member, you know how far gone they are. You know what I'm saying? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. I remember when I took Rebecca out on our very first date, I sat across the table from her. I confessed everything that I knew of that I had done that would impact a potential relationship with her in our first date. It was probably a little too much, but I did it, all right? I just said, you need to know who you're dealing with. And she responded to me and she said, Dylan, thank you for telling me. Get emotional just thinking that. She said, but that's who you were. It's not who you are in Christ. I don't see that. I see what Christ has done in your life. <laughs> if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This is what Christ has done in your life. But then he goes on. He says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. That word reconciled means to make a right relationship, to restore a right relationship. So God has brought us back to himself through, the, through reconciliation and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The moment you receive Christ, you not only receive your own reconciliation with God, you also receive a ministry of reconciliation from God. You are already a minister of reconciliation. Whether you do it or not is a different thing, but you are already a minister of reconciliation. Some people ask me, Dylan, when did you get into the ministry? And I say, the day I got saved. What? Yeah, the day I called the name of Jesus, I got in the ministry, and you did too. You may not recognize it, but you did. Ministry is not something just pastors do. Ministry is something every Christian is called to. And you've been given. So let me say it to you this way. If I were to put out a job posting tomorrow for the King's Kids Ministry Director role at King's Church, and, and some of y'all applied, and we did some interviews, and I hired one person, and I said, okay, you are now the, the director of the King's Kids Ministry. It's the most important ministry at King's Church you would have been entrusted with that ministry. Now, whether you're faithful with it or not, it's a different story. But you got the job. You tracking? In the same way, when you received Christ, yo, you applied for a job, and you got accepted, okay? And you got the job of the ministry of reconciliation. That ministry's been given to you. It's in your lap. That ball is in your court. And God has entrusted you with the message of salvation. Wow. I don't care what you do for a vocation. I don't care if you're the CEO of Amazon. There is nothing greater God could entrust you with than the ministry and the message of reconciliation through faith in his son Jesus. Yeah. And every single one of y'all got that. Yeah. 
This is God's grace to you, and God has called you to it. Here's the deal. My guess is most of you say, okay, Dylan, I got you. I know I need to share Christ with people who don't know Christ. And I want to, I feel compelled to, because my preaching is just that good. I know, I know. But you don't know how to. And you feel overwhelmed, inadequate. You feel afraid, insecure. I want to help you with that bit for the next 10 minutes, okay? I'm going to give you a cheesy acronym called BLESS. All right, if you're taking notes, write it down. If you're not taking notes, just write it down. Okay, so cheesy acronym called BLESS. Begin with prayer, listen, eat, serve, story. I'm going to unpack them for you, okay? So begin with prayer. You need to talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. It's simple, I know, but it's powerful. When you pray, you open the door for what only God can do in somebody's life. This is my story. My sister went off to college. She gets saved. She starts praying for me every day. She's writing me letters. I'm praying for you. I love you. I want you to know Jesus. I start working at a fitness center, and a dude starts working there who just received Christ playing Xbox with some other guy who was telling him about Jesus. All right, you can lead people to Christ playing Xbox. You can play video games, just tell people about Jesus. That's my rule, okay? That's the rule, all right? He just received Christ, and he's sharing Christ with me every week. My girlfriend starts taking me to church. Girls taking me to church, dude sharing Jesus, sister praying her guts out for me. I get saved about eight months later, okay? And I start going to this dude's church. Mike Sandusky, he leads Living Hope Church. He preaches at our church every now and then. Great dude, love him to death. I start going to his church, and people start saying to me, I'm like, hey, my name's Dylan. What's your name? Are you the Dylan? I'm like, yeah, dang right I am. You know? <laughs> and they're like, we've been praying for you for months. A whole church was praying for me. There's power in prayer, y'all. My sister, I asked her, why did you pray so fervently for me? She said, I didn't want to get to heaven and not see my brother there. There's power in your prayers. Talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. I was out to eat a few months back with some dudes in our church. We went to Third Street Social. And, and one of the things we often do is we ask the waitress, can we pray for you? We're going to pray before our meal anything we can pray for you about. It's a great little thing to do. We're going to pray before our meal. Anything we can pray for you about is so easy. Every time they tell you something. She kind of shares some struggles in her life. We said, we'll pray for you after you, know, after you walk away. She walks away, we pray for her. She comes back a few minutes later, just bawling. She said, I've been a waitress for years. Never happened to me. She said, you guys asked me how you could pray for me. I walk out to the table out back. They asked how they could pray for me. God's on my case tonight. And we said, has anybody ever shared the gospel with you? And she said, oh, yeah, I learned the gospel as a kid. Acknowledge that you're a sinner and you need a savior. Believe in Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. And confess your sins to God and, and receive eternal life. And I was like, yeah, girl, you got it, you know? <laughs> and so she had known Christ and walked away from Christ, and that night she rededicated her. We held hands with her. We all circled. We prayed for her. She's a bawling like a baby. You should have seen her. Keith was there. You should have just floating around that restaurant. Like, she, she just made a million bucks, you know? She got better than a million bucks. She got her sins washed away by Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Come on. That's begin with prayer. There's power in your prayer. Number two, listen. God gave you two ears, one mouth for a reason. And I'm a preacher, okay? I talk a lot, so i got to work on this one. But he gave you two ears, one mouth for a reason. There's power. You know one of the greatest demands, one of the greatest needs in our society is people who listen? Pe people in our culture are so desperate for a meaningful conversation with someone who's listening, not just to speak back what they have on their mind, but listening because they love. And when you listen to people, you unlock doors in their heart. I would encourage you, listen because you love, but also ask meaningful questions. Questions like, do you have any religious experience? Questions like, what do you think about Jesus? My favorite question of all time, are you a person of faith? Are you a person? It opened so many doors for me over the years. Actually, Austin, sitting right there, wave your hand, Austin. Austin is our production team leader. He leads all things tech. Austin is a small group leader in this church. Austin is a part of our youth leadership team. Austin received Christ four years ago because Sarah, who was up on that band today, asked a simple question, are you a person of faith? Let him into a discussion about Jesus. Let him do a Bible study in the Gospel of John. And then our first Easter service, worst online experience ever. Austin's trying to redeem it. That's why he's the production team leader. He's like, never again will I put someone through that. You know, He gives his life to Christ. There's so much power in listening, Keith and I were out golfing a few months ago. He made fun of me for my golf game a few sermons ago. I can't believe he would do such a thing. I'm a great golfer. I golfed 114 last time I golfed. That's a, 
That tells you how bad I am, okay? We're all golfing. We were just him and I. So we got paired up with two other dudes. Keith's an amazing question asker. So he's asking, tell me about your life. Tell me about this. You guys are church guys? Just sliding it in there. Just loving on these dudes, sharing Christ with these. We, we didn't hit a home run, but we sowed a little seed. There's power in your listening. Okay, number three, so you need to begin with prayer. You need to listen. Number three, you need to eat. Come on, somebody. <laughs> My favorite one in the list. Okay? Your God is a God who loves to eat. I love him so much more for it. One commentator on the Gospel of Luke, I just got to tell you, one commentator said, every time you see Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, He's coming from, at, or going to a meal. I was like, mm, hallelujah. <laughs> some barbecue ribs, okay? So there's, there's power. Actually, the table, the table biblically, it's very biblical. It's very beautiful. It's very powerful, your table. And I don't care if you got a little TV dinner table, just make room for another plate, you know. Or you got an apartment, or maybe you got a big house. I don't know what your table is, but whatever table you have, there's power inviting people to your table. Had to led so many people to Christ in a coffee shop across the table, at a restaurant across the table, in my house across the table. There's power. There, there's nothing that pulls down barriers more than sitting across the table from someone because you're enjoying a, a human experience. You're just like me. We're just sheep in need of a shepherd. There's intimacy. There's, there's care. There's love around a shared table. When we first moved to Kansas City, all of our friends were in St. Louis. All my wife's friends were in St. Louis. All my kids' friends were in St. We left it all to come plant King's Church. And we didn't know, we didn't really know anybody who had young kids. So my wife's a young mom, young kids. She's jumped on Facebook. Anybody want to hang out? You know, Facebook mom's group. She's hitting them up. This woman named Bree. Bree and Nate, members of our church here this morning. And I can't see good, but I, I know they're in the room. Hey, they're in the balcony. Love you guys. And uh, jumped on a Facebook group. Her and Bree start kicking it, hanging out. And they, they shared meals together. You know how fancy the meals were? The, the, the kids' dino chicken nuggets. You know, we just, we high rollers here at King's Church. You know, those dinosaur chicken nuggets get people saved, okay? And Bree and Rebecca start hanging out. Rebecca's sharing Christ with her. I remember being, on, being in the car with Rebecca. Rebecca's on the phone with Bree. She jumps off the phone. Bree just gave her life to Jesus. And Bree and Nate, some of the dearest friends we have, just love them to death. Bree leads our nursery team in this church. Uh, there's power around a table. There's power around a shared life. Actually, I don't even know if you guys know this. In this season, their family, their children, one of the, one of the greatest gifts to our family. We came here to serve people. They end up serving us, and, and we get to share Christ with them. Such a beautiful, beautiful thing that God did. Number four, you're going to begin with prayer. You're going to listen. You're going to eat, and then what are you going to do? You're going to serve, and if you do the first three, people will tell you how to do the fourth one. If you pray for them, you listen to them, you eat with them, they're going to tell you all their problems, and you've got a whole lot of opportunities to serve them in the name of Jesus, okay? You could, you could bring a, a coworker a coffee and serve them. You could shovel someone's snow out of their driveway. You could fix someone's house up. You could do a little house project, okay? There's so many ways you can serve people. I remember our little apartment in St. Louis. There was a man named Rick who lived next to us, and Rick was a 70-year-old man. He was an atheist. He had lived a homosexual lifestyle most of his life, and, and uh, he was raised Catholic. And Rick told me, I was asking him, Rick, where are you at with Jesus? Where are you at with faith? And he said, Dylan, I, I would never be accepted in the church. I said, what do you think would happen if you walked in a church, Rick? Rick said to me, Dylan, if I walked in the back of a church, the music would stop, everybody would turn around, look at me, and say, what is he doing here? And then I'd probably get struck with lightning. And I said, Rick, that breaks my heart because that may be how the church has treated you, but that's not how Christ would treat you. And I just was racking my brain, God, how do I show this man who Jesus is? And I looked outside and I saw his front porch. He sat on his coffee and sat on his front porch to drink coffee every morning, but his front porch, the roof was literally caving in. So much so the mailman wouldn't even deliver the mail to Rick's house. And uh, he just dropped it on the front little stoop. He's like, I ain't dying today, you know. And, and I said, Rick, how would you feel if a few of us guys in the church, and I just hit up some contractor guys in our church, so how would you feel if we ripped the, the roof off, rebuilt your roof, and just, just loved on you? And he said, man, I can't afford it. And I said, we'll figure it out. And these guys came together. These amazing men in our church. In one day, they ripped the whole roof. This is, a, this is a roof from the drum kit over to the keyboard. I mean, it was a big roof. Ripped it off, rebuilt the whole thing, shingled the whole thing. I didn't know sheet metal was involved in roofing. And so I did all the sheet metal afterwards. I figured out how. But we did all this in one day. And we got to foot the bill and tell Rick it's paid for in Jesus' name. And Rick said to me, he said, Dylan, I don't know what it is about you. 
but I wish, I wish more Christians were like you. And I said, Rick, I don't, want, I don't want you to think anything of me. I just want you to know Jesus Christ. I don't know if Rick knows Jesus today or not. You could pray for him when you walk out of here. But I'm telling you, there's power in your service. God will use it to show off Christ to a dying and lost world. Finally, you want to share Christ with people. That's your fifth one, share Christ. You can share Christ with people anywhere, and you can do it with anybody. I've seen people share Christ in restaurants, Starbucks, grocery stores, out on a street corner, in a car, on a train station. You can share Christ anywhere, church, and you can share it with any one. I think most of you probably don't know how, so I'm going to give you three ways to share Christ. Number one, you can share your story. John chapter 4, there's a woman at the well, a sinful woman with a bad reputation. And when she met Jesus, she went running into town and simply told everybody what Christ had done for her. John chapter 4, verse 39 says what happened when she told her story. It says many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Say testimony. testimony. I just got to wake you up. Say testimony. testimony. Many people believed, not because she was a good orator, not because she was a good preacher, not because of her charismatic personality, not because she was a high roller and had a big reputation. She had the lowest reputation in the community. But many believed because of her Wake up. Many people believe because of her testimony. her testimony. And many more believed. They heard her testimony. They said, we don't know. We got to see for ourselves. They went up to Jesus. They hear his word. And it says many more believed because of his word. There's power in your story. Simply share your story with people. Sit back and watch what God does. Number two, make an invitation. I can't tell you how much power there is in your invitation. Those little cards, those packet of cards on your seat, do you know we put those there not just for them to look pretty on a Sunday morning? We put those packets there for you to take them out and invite everybody in the community to come and hear what Christ has done for them. Take them. Every time you buy a coffee and you're feeling guilty because you spent eight bucks on a caramel maki tada tada whatever, every time just say, hey, in Jesus' name, come to church. And then you can feel good about that eight dollars you spent. All right? So every time you go to a grocery store, every time you see a net, just... Take these, and there's so much power in your invitation. Luke 14, Jesus tells the parable of the wedding feast, and the father sending his servants out to tell the guests, you're invited to my son's wedding. And these guests were so disrespectful. They delayed the invitation of the son, and they denied the invitation of the son. So disrespectful. The father responds to his servants, and he says, the master said to the servant, go on to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Can I tell you, if you invite people for no other reason, do it because you want to see God get so much glory by his house being so filled with people who love his son. There's power in your invitation. Number three, share the gospel. Share the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it's one of my favorite verses in all of scripture, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Say, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Say it like you mean it, I'm not ashamed. There's a whole lot of reasons to be ashamed in this life. Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is not one of them. Your home is heaven. Your eternity is with Christ. Who cares what other people think of you? Who cares if your boss fires you? You can get another job. Who? You can. Who cares what your neighbors think? If they don't call on his name, they pay for their sins for all eternity. How unloving to not tell them that he died for them. Who cares if you're not invited back to happy hour? Who cares if maybe some people think less of you because you think much of Christ? I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power. It's the dudamis. You want some Greek in there? It's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, the Jews, and then all of us. The power of God for salvation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And every time it comes out of your mouth, you preach good news to a lost and dying world. The Apostle Paul says, my hands are free from the blood of all men because I preach Christ to them. Some of us, our hands are not free of the blood of all men because we've kept our lips sealed about Christ. And God is calling us to preach Christ everywhere we go.
It's my prayer for you that every single one of you would have the joy of leading someone to Christ in the next 12 months of this calendar year. That you would know the joy of holding someone's hand and walking them across that line of faith. I'm going to ask you to find your one. One more person. One friend, one family member, one coworker, one neighbor. I don't care who they are, where they come from, what they've done. One more person who doesn't know Christ. To find them, to pray for them, to listen to them, to eat with them, to serve them, and to share Christ with them. And when you're trying to share Christ with them, I want to show you this little... This little uh, graph, it's called the three circles. It's one of the simplest ways to share Christ. You want to take a picture of it? You can look it up online. There's YouTube videos, all the stuff called the three circles. With Bless, there's also something called the Bless app to teach you how to share Christ with people far from God. The Bless app is so helpful. It has this in it. You start by saying who God is and what God did. I was at a Starbucks and I was just sitting there doing a little study and I look up, there's this man sitting across from me at another table. You know how it is, you kind of make eye contact. How you doing? You know, and we started talking. And I said, tell me about yourself, and tell me about your life, and tell me who you are. I started asking him, and then I asked him, are you a person of faith? And he said, I'm a Muslim. I said, oh, tell me more about that. He tells me all about his Muslim faith, okay? And I said, can I share with you what I believe? He said, yeah, sure. And I got out a little napkin, and I drew this. And I said, well, God is a good God, a loving God, and he created the world perfect. There's no sickness, there's no death, there's no disease, no sin, no evil, no war. Just God's perfect love with God's people on a perfect earth. I said, but then sin entered into the world. Man and woman, they disobeyed God, and brokenness came with sin, and death and disease, all that junk came with sin. But God, in his love for humanity, he promised to send someone to save us from our sin, Jesus Christ. And he lived the perfect life that we failed to live, and he died in our place for our sins. He rose up from the dead, and then he went back to heaven, and he said all who called on his name would be with him for all eternity. They'd be saved from their sins. And one day, Jesus is coming back, and he's going to bring us back to this. And if you call on his name, you'll be with him. And if you don't, you won't. And this young man said to me, he said, that's so beautiful. I've never heard anything like it. He said, I wish I could believe it was true. I said, why can't you? He said, my whole family would disown me. He saw Christ, but he couldn't get past the cost of following Jesus. He ended up attending our church. He got in a small group. He got surrounded by believers. Still to this day, I don't know if he received Jesus, but let me tell you, there was a big old seed sown in his heart. Friends, you can share the gospel with people everywhere you go. And if you want to share the gospel with some Spanish speakers, we got a little pamphlet out there on the connect table with these three circles in Spanish for you to share Christ with people, even if you don't know their language. Will you stand to your feet? I want to pray for you. I've taken up way too much of your time. So I hope you get a good nap this afternoon. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your call to be witnesses. I just pray, would you fill us full of the Holy Spirit? Give us courage to go to people who don't know Christ and share Jesus with them. Make us a church that blesses, B-L-E-S-S, that we bless people who are far from God. And I pray every person in this room would have the joy of leading one person to Christ, seeing them up here in that baptismal tank, over the next year. Oh God, help us to put first what matters most to you, your lost kids. It's in Jesus' name.